started uh, with the presentation. And at any time, if you have any questions, uh, please do feel free to interrupt. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I'm sure Mohit and Sonalika are watching. Uh, they can interrupt me, or I'm not sure if they have the ability to unmute and ask the question, but um, let's have a productive session here. And let me get started. Hope you all can see my slides, correct? Okay, you all can see my slides, correct? Yes, can everyone see my slides? Uh, yes, ma'am, we can see your slides. Okay, Thank good, you. Good, good, good. So, um, the plan for this week, um, I'm just gonna give you the plan for this week. So today we are going to go in steps, right? So today we're gonna to introduce what bioinformatics is. Uh, overview of bioinformatics, why are we in uh, drowned in data? Uh, so the meaning of what big data is. And then tomorrow we're gonna to talk uh, to you about protein structure and function. So at the end of the day, in your body, there are lots of proteins, DNA, RNA, small molecules, and everything else floating around in every single cell. And all of them are not floating around with, a, with just a sequence, right? Long sequences. And you know, your genome is six feet long. It's not like the whole in the cell, it's like, you know, whole sequences. They all fold into compact three-dimensional structures. And that is what helps them with their functions. So they have to fold into three-dimensional structures in order to be able to um, do their functions within the cell. So tomorrow we're gonna to look at biology in three dimensions. We're gonna look at how protein structures help us understand functions. And then we are going to follow with hands-on sessions where you will learn different informatic resources that you can go to to get information. Uh, Uniprot, which is one of the universal resources and protein hubs for bioinformatics in the world. So Uniprot NCBI is another standing uh, universal hub for bioinformatics in the world. And then we'll go through Ensemble and Genome-Wide Association Studies. So these are some of the databases that we will visit, but this should be more than enough for you to get a grasp and do lots of different projects because these are all gold mines. This is where all the data is residing. You just have to learn how to get data from there and use it for meaningful research purposes. So by end of this course, you will actually be able to do that. Ask questions, biological questions, look at diseases that you're interested in and use all of these resources and come up with a very nice project. And then we will look at uh, structures in three dimensions. We look at the whole biology in three dimensions. So we'll use a couple of tools that uh, Sonalika and Mohit will uh, let you know how to download uh, and use and make some pretty pictures of protein structures, understand how a single mutation in a protein leads to a disease. So it is, it is hard to believe, right? There are proteins that are 10,000 amino acids but just one single mutation, one single change in an amino acid changes them to an extent that they cause disease, right? And then finally, we will have applications of bioinformatics and we'll wrap up uh, this week with some activities for you to do so that whatever you learned during the course of this week, you will apply to a project and you will be able to do your own projects. So that is what this week is going to look like. And then when we get started with the next week, uh, then we'll tell you what um, you will uh, get into. The speaker on Friday is actually leads uh, one of the leaders in Uniprot, which is a universal protein database. So you're gonna hear from the horse's mouth. She is the one who leads a lot of efforts in uh, the databases that we'll actually be using. So you will actually hear from the horse's mouth as well on, on Friday. So, so now let's get started. Are you all excited? So today the learning objectives is, you will learn the definition. If nothing else, you're gonna learn what is bioinformatics, right? And then what are lots of challenges that we are facing today because of all the data that we have. 
and then omics. What are the different omics, right? If I go, we have like 60 participants on this call. So if I ask each and every one of you to give me an omics term, we are gonna have leftover omic terms. So we have like more than 300 omic terms, right? So, and that's what is leading to big data. And, and this data is being used in medicine, right? To solve diseases. At the end of the day, all of us are interested in understanding diseases. All of us are interested in understanding how to solve and cure our diseases and everything else, right? Now we are in the pandemic and thankfully, of course, we are still in the middle of the pandemic and we still have a long way to go before uh, we actually get out of this pandemic. And all of you are learning about this Delta variant. And I'm sure those of you in India are hit very hard uh, by it. And every day uh, my prayers goes out to the whole world and we all wanna get out. So there's only one variant, right? There are a couple of variants, but yet that one single variant is causing a lot of changes in the spike protein to increase the infectability of this particular virus, right? Why is one single variant, one single mutation is causing so much of havoc, right? So those are the things that we're gonna learn that how this is affecting. Of course, our topic for this week is not gonna be COVID, uh, but I'm sure that you have learned about COVID from other courses as well. Now, all of this data has given rise to a whole new field called the genomics, right? So we are all drowning. And why is it so important for all of us to learn this? I call this a new language in a new way. And all of us need to learn this language, whether you want to become a scientist, you want, you're already scientists, whether you're doing bioinformatics or you wanna go into machine learning, you wanna go into different aspects, this is a language that you all and all of us have to learn in order to be able to do several aspects within the field of bioinformatics, right? And so now before we get into bioinformatics, I wanna know, do you all know what is informatics? Leave alone bio, we'll add bio to this, but what is informatics? We are all drowning in an era of informatics. So what is informatics to you all? You can all put it in the chat of what you think is informatics to you. What is informatics? So let's have a dialogue so that it's not boring and some of you it's late, I don't want you to sleep. So let's make it very interactive right now. So what is informatics? So whatever you feel like, just put it in the chat of what you think is informatics. And you're, you're, you're here to learn uh, some of the aspects of it, right? So dealing with information, I love that because information, right, informatics, so dealing with information, yes, I like that definition. Um, handling data and for information, data, that's wonderful. I think all of you are trying to put this together, right? So we are dealing with information through facts about something, yes, and then computation is going too fast for me, so I'm not reading your names here, but I'm just reading what you have here. Informatic request management of large, exactly, large amount of data to get meaningfully, absolutely, Gerald. So, I think all of you processing data, computational information, fantastic. This is an amazing group. I'm gonna love it and my energy is gonna, I my energy goes up and up based on interaction I get, right? So my voice will start going up and up because I'm so excited from it, all that you're putting out there. Alfred, I think informatic fields collection and processing, exactly. So to summarize every bit of what all of you have said, right? It is information, that's what it's all about. And how do you get meaningful? How do you extract meaningful data used based on this data? How do you get information? Based on this information, how do you convert that to knowledge that is going to be meaningful to use, right? Amazing. So it's all about data, 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 right? So it's all about data and how do you process the data? Amazing, all of you have already given that, right? So it's a study of how information is collected, it's stored, and how do we manipulate this data? And how is it classified? How is it organized? How is it retrieved? And how is it visualized? All of this is what we're gonna learn this, this week, right? Now, how does it differ from information technology? Dang. In, info, Dang. Information science. And how does it differ from computer science, right? I'm sure, I'm sure all of, I think some, uh, I think, I think I think someone has your, um, you're not muted your mind, I guess. So 
information science, computer science. So do you all think that informatics is the same thing as information technology? Is it the same thing as computer science? Yes or no? You can just put yes or no. What do you think? Is it, is it the same as information technology or is something different? Informatics is something different from computer science. What do you think? Yes, no, yes, it is the same. No, it is not. Divya says yes. It is no. So you both your answers are correct. It's probably a discipline. That's true. So yes and no, right? So, so you will see, I'm going to, yes, it is yes and no. Both answers are actually correct. And you must be thinking, wow, what is, what is going on? So we're going to learn why both answers are correct in a second, right? Yes. So can we live without informatics today? I'm pretty sure each and every one of you is going to say what? Is it yes or no? Can we live without informatics today? You and me are communicating 10,000 miles away and it's all because of technology, right? So, and we are just Googling with a phone and you can do lots of mathematics. So yes, absolutely, that is the correct answer. So we cannot live with an informatics today. Whether you believe it or not, you are all generating data every single day and every single minute. All of you, you may be wondering how, but you are generating data. So when you Google something up, right? So go to Amazon or something, you're clicking something. In a way, you're not aware, but you're actually generating data. Amazon is collecting every single click to figure out who's buying what. That is data, right? So all of us are living with data and we cannot live without informatics, absolutely not. Every day we are touched by and influenced by informatics. And I'm pretty sure your generation, all of you use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of these things, right? So we are living in a data-centric world and new data acquisition devices are coming. We're all creating data. Like I said, all of you are creating data. Each one of us is creating data. And where is this data going? And each one of us are creating different types of data. And people are using these different types of data to figure out, right? So even this vaccine, how many people are taking vaccine? And where does this vaccine roll out? Which, which states have better vaccine rollout than other states? And all of those things, it's all about data, right? They're all collecting data. Now, all of you said one thing very nicely, right? So we are living in a data-centric world, but how are we going to, the skills that you all need is how do we use this data, get information out of it, meaningful information out of it, and how do we convert that meaningful information into knowledge, right? Okay, so go a little bit slow. Okay, I will go a little bit slow, okay? And the other thing is we are, no, we are not in a big rush. So if I'm not able to finish everything that I plan for today, we'll continue tomorrow. So, okay, um, I will go slow, okay? Now, when I get excited, Harita, I go very fast. So, okay, let me slow down here, right? So up to now, the, what I'm trying to tell you is informatics is extremely important. What is informatics? Informatics is about data. It's different kinds of data. And how do, we, uh, how do we get information out of this data? How do we convert that data to knowledge, right? So far, that's as far as we have gone, right? Now, there is no escape for any one of us, even, you know, some of you, I heard little kids in the thing background. So even kids have to learn all of this, right? So if you give a kid an iPad, they know how to figure this out, right? So we are in an era of data and how to use all of this technology that is there, right? So data keeps coming, people with needs and hunger for tools, and there are systems that are created, right? So you have data, you have people, you have systems and informatics, right? So data to knowledge, right? So now informatics, now I wanna put informatics in perspective, right? So we are talking about something very specific, right? We are talking about biological data. We are not talking about other kinds of data, right? We are talking about biological data. So there is bioinformatics. There are different types of informatics, right? So you have bioinformatics. It deals with molecules, like it deals with proteins. It, leads, it deals with RNA. It leads with DNA. And then you have imaging informatics that deals with tissues. I'm sure that you all had an X-ray at some point, or you've had an ultrasound at some point, or MRI at some point. So those are all about tissues and entire organ systems, right? And then we have what's called clinical informatics, which is all about patients. It is all about informatics, about patients, if someone has a disease and something like that. And then public health, health informatics is populations. It's about society. 
you and me together, we all form a society, right? So this informatics in perspective, right? So clinical informatics is all of this come under the umbrella of health informatics and biomedical informatics is not the same as health informatics. This is all consumers, right? So there is a product that is there. If you wanna measure your blood pressure, there is a product, right? So you use a blood pressure um, device and that is all about consumer health informatics, right? So then what is bioinformatics? This entire course is going to be focusing only on one small aspect of this whole ocean of informatics, which is called the bioinformatics, right? So now coming to what is bioinformatics? You all gave an amazing definition of what is informatics. Now let's define what is bioinformatics. You all define informatics. What is bioinformatics? Any guesses of what is bioinformatics? Any definitions come to your mind of what is bioinformatics? Do you like, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic inter interpretation of biological data. That is, that is correct. In bridge between biology and computer. Oh, I love that definition. That is exactly what the initial definition was, deals with tools, absolutely. There are different aspects to bioinformatics, right? So you have a computer, so a long time ago, right? So it was like, use a computer and a mouse, that was called an information, and then it was biology, yes. That is the science of collecting, analyzing, yes, absolutely, this is a very good definition, right? So the National Institute of Health here, in the US, they came up with a formal definition of bioinformatics. It's research, development, application of computational tools and approaches. And it's pretty much about, again, as you see, it is the same thing that we talked about. It is, yes, it is collection of biological data. And how do you use this for looking at diseases? And yes, absolutely benefits to humankind, right? So analyze and visualization of bioinformatics, right? So now it's about biological data. You have, you actually do experiments in a computer, right? So it's not easy. People think bioinformatics is easy. It's actually more difficult than experimentation, right? So you're doing a lot of experiments within the computer, right? So you have data. How do you look at the data? How do you do calculations of this data? And how do you get meaningful things, right? So there are lots of different subdisciplines within bioinformatics, right? So you need uh, to develop algorithms, right? Google, right? You all do, all of us are so used to doing Google search, right? Anything you want to know, you go to Google, right? You don't need anything else. That's scary, right? You don't need me, you just go to Google. You just go to Google, you type something and Google is going to pull up something. Now behind that, some programmer has developed that algorithm and a search engine for you to do it. That programmer probably does not, may not be a biologist, may not understand proteins, right? So, and also the minute you have data, we need statistics as well, right? So you can just say this person has a mutation, but then now you wanna see whether it's statistically significant to see that mutation in a population, right? So it is statistics, right? So then you also want to analyze this data. You wanna interpret this data, various kinds of data, right? Nucleotide data, amino acid diet, which is all biological data, right? At the end of the day. And then, of course, you want to people to develop tools so that you and me, there's lots of data, but if, if it's not put in the form of a database, and if it doesn't have a search engine, all of us are not programmers, so we won't know how to get that data, right? So, so as immediately, just from the slide, you can already see that bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field. It needs collaboration with different people, right? Different disciplines. You need a biologist to understand biology. You need mathematicians to and statisticians to come up with algorithms. And then you need people to develop tools, right? You need software engineers. So already, you know that bioinformatics is actually an interdisciplinary field, right? right? And so this is about the interpret analysis and interpretation. But today and for the next week or two, right? Two weeks in this course, we are only going to focus on the biology of all of these things, right? So we are not going to do anything like that. Now, is bioinformatics a new field? What do you think? Is bioinformatics? Bio no, absolutely. Okay, so how many of you think that bioinformatics is not a new field? How old is bioinformatics? Right? Yes, you're all correct. 
that bioinformatics is actually not a new field. It is actually an old field that has existed for a while. We just didn't name it uh, in 1953. So I'm, I, I think where I, I know where Ahmad is heading, right? But we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, you no idea. Okay. So bioinformatics, the answer is, it's actually not a new field. It has actually existed for decades, right? So do you all know where bioinformatics was born and who gave birth to bioinformatics in the world? Yes, that is true, since DNA model, that's correct. Amit. So do you all know where bioinformatics was born? Who gave, which country or which continent uh, gave birth to bioinformatics? Since Human Genome Project or Uniprot, Gerald, that's correct. USA, okay, USA is correct. Yeah, yeah. so um, Juhar Singh is a uh, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. Okay, that's in Geneva. So, we, so a lot of you are saying it's USA. Is that is that what you all think? Uh, that bioinformatics was born in USA? Is that what you all think? Yes, actually, that is correct. I would actually spend a lot of time, but you already, all of you actually got the correct answer right away. Yes, bioinformatics actually was born in the USA. But do you all know where in the USA, which state in the USA gave birth to bioinformatics? Any idea? San Diego? Okay. Yes, most people actually guess California as, as a reason, and I'm not sure why. Washington, D.C.? Okay. <laughs> Um, MAMS Institute, wow. Sasta Kumar, you have actually come, you have actually, you know, taken away the thrill where the Uniprot was initiated, okay? So bioinformatics, as um, Sasta Kumar said, is actually born at Georgetown University. I'm actually very proud to say that. Um, and, and the tribute of that goes to uh, someone called Robert Head Lindley. He actually died in 2012 uh, from, uh, from actually Alzheimer's disease, sadly. And he is uh, the person who actually invented the whole body CT scan as well, the first CT scanner as well. And he also published a book way before my time as well, Reasoning Foundations of Medical that led to computers. So I, in, in the 50s, he already said, you know what? He was a visionary. He already said computers are going to lead the world and computer and he is the person who identified the person who gave birth to the field of bioinformatics do you all know who actually gave birth of course now we all have come bioinformatics was born at georgetown university and bioinformatics do you know who the person is who actually gave birth and who's officially declared as the visionary for bioinformatics anyone knows the name of this person uh, who came up with uh, the field, uh, who takes the credit for coming up and giving birth to bioinformatics at Georgetown University. Any guesses? This person, once I tell you the name, you're going to say, oh yeah, I know this person. This person has done lots and lots of other things as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Sasta Kumar, you're answering all my questions. <laughs> yes, you're correct. Um, right, yes, it is Margaret Dayhoff, right? So uh, Margaret Dehoff is the person who gave birth to bioinformatics and she came up with, uh, yes, actually Uniprot was also initiated, one of the uh, pioneers of initiation of um, Uniprot also exists at, at Georgetown University. So in the 1950s and 1960s, right, um, she came up with the first atlas of protein sequence and structure information. In the 60s, it, where bioinformatics was actually published in a book. So all the sequences of, of hemoglobin or myoglobin or any sequence that you want to know, you actually, they used to mail this book uh, to everyone, right? So she also has contributed significantly to other things. So she is the person in the 60s said that, you know what, we are going to have a huge amount of data coming, so we need to create databases. So she actually was the person who came up with the concept of databases. And believe it or not, she is the person who actually came up with a single letter code for amino acids. Glycine, you just simply write G. Alanine, you simply write A, right? So there are so many amino acids, simple, single letter code. Valine, you simply write V, right? So she is the person who came up with a single letter. And there is a big story 
in the interest, interest of time, I'm not going to go through that story. That's for another time, right? So she's the person who came up with the code because in the 60s, like you are all walking with a cell phone, right? With gigabytes of data. You can do computation on cell phones right now, right? But there in the 60s, they did not have enough computing power. They All that they had was kilobytes and megabytes of data stored in space. So she had to come up with an intelligent way to store huge amounts of data, right? So, so from DNA to genome, right? So these are all the milestone in the field of bioinformatics, right? So I think someone here said, I think this, I'm not sure, was it Ahmed? I'm not sure, who said 1953. Yes, uh, Watson and Crick came up with uh, the DNA model. And then we have saying the sequences was sequence, right? And uh, and then saying a singer came up with all of these things, right? So sequence alignments came up in the 70s and protein data bank where structures were stored. We will actually, you will be learning about protein data bank. And then gene bank databases, all of this from G DNA to genome. These are all the landmark discoveries that led to the field of bioinformatics as it stands today, right? So all of you said that bioinformatics is not a new field and you are correct, bioinformatics is not a new field. But the term bioinformatics was coined in the 90s. And so the first time bioinformatics came in the literature was sometime in the 90s, although all the discoveries and everything was made in starting in the 50s. And now it's recognized as a field and it's recognized as a field that no one can escape. All of us need to learn this language of informatics, right, to move forward. So all of these are seminal contributions to the field. So this was one of the biggest contributions is the Human Genome Initiative to understand what you and me are made up of. So once you understand what you're made of, we can solve all the diseases and the problems, right? So NCBI, National Center for Biotechnology Information, still stands today as the universal hub of bioinformatics in the world. Every person goes to NCBI to get information about sequences or structures or, or, or um, sequencing data. Anything you want, you go to NCBI, right? So it still remains as the hub for NCBI and I came into the world of bioinformatics when I started working at NCBI, right? So uh, some of these things are personal to me because I worked at NCBI and that's how I learned um, many things and this field I was introduced when I worked and I actually work, work and work for Uniprot as well. So that is uh, where I started appreciating uh, what this field is all about and how much you can use this field. And without knowing all of these resources, whether you want to be a bench scientist or anything, you still need to know the language of informatics, right? So FASTA and BLAST is a tool. I'm sure all of you have used BLAST. All of you know what BLAST is. We will actually be using that tool as well, right? So these are all some of the seminal contributions in the field and all of these things initiated or to data explosion that caused it, right? So so the origin of bioinformatics and databases, the first protein sequence that was reported was insulin in the 50s and Sanger was the one who sequenced uh, and he won the Nobel Prize for sequencing insulin in the 50s, right? But in the 50s, what he did was it took like 10 years to sequence insulin, although it's a very small protein, right? And then it was like one base after base he was sequencing. Imagine we have hundreds of COVID-19 sequences right now, right? And that's how we know that there are lots of different variants. And if a patient comes down with COVID, we know exactly whether they're having the Delta variant or they're having the Alpha variant. How do we know that? We know that because we're able to sequence things in a very short amount of time. In the 50s, it took 10 years or 15 years or 20 years to come up with sequencing, right? One basis at a time. Now we have high, high throughput next generation sequencing, right? Huge amounts of data can be produced within, fraction, within an hour or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, right? So that's where we have come. We have come from sequencing that took 20 years to sequencing that just takes an hour or so, right? So very quickly. So nearly a decade later, the first nucleated sequence was uh, sequenced. And then a major event happened that was to change the course of human history, right? So it was a joint British and American effort 
and it was a race who will complete first a race test, not whether they have taken the drugs or what, but it was the human genome that was actually sequenced in 2003. Since 2003, once the human genome sequence was sequenced, that we know, yes, exactly, AGP, Human Genome Project, that's correct, right? So the whole human genome was sequenced. That means, do we know every bit of protein and DNA that is existing within us? Do you think that the sequencing uh, has given us more data? Actually, yes, the, this Human Genome Project was the start uh, of everything that we are seeing, the data explosion that we are seeing today, right? So for a detailed history of this, we, might, we may not have time to go through that. You can go to this website. This sequencing of the Human Genome Project, it ended up to be one of the biggest breakthroughs in the history of humanity, I would say, right? That got all of us started in this new, learning this new language and using it to cure, understand diseases. And it has actually given birth to huge number of many, many disciplines, right? Now I'm telling you that the Human Genome Project is completed in 2003. We have the sequence of the human genome. Does it mean that we know every single thing that we need to know about the humans? What do you think? Do we know everything we need to know about ourselves? Because of this human genome, it's 2003, right? So it's almost like 16, 17 or 18 years ago. But today we still are all diseases. Do we understand all diseases today? What do you think? Have you cured all the diseases? No, we have not, right? We have learned a lot, but we still don't, we still have, we still have a long way to go. We are able to understand many things, but yes, that is correct, right? We don't, that answer is correct, no. And I'll tell you why we don't have not solved the mystery of human diseases. Even COVID, right? We are in COVID for a year and a half almost. Do we have a cure for COVID? The entire world is looking at one problem of trying to find a therapeutic for COVID. We don't. But thanks to science, thanks to the Human Genome Project, we have a vaccine. We have a successful vaccine that is extremely efficacious. And how are we able to come up with the vaccine within a course of one year? It's thanks to the advancement in technology, thanks to the advancement and understanding of the human genome, right? So we understand that and that's why we're able to make progress. But do we know everything? No, we don't know. There are lots of challenges and those are the challenges that I'm gonna to talk to you, right? At the conclusion of the Human Genome Project, right? So complete sequencing, it has generated a new branch of uh, science and medicine and which is called the genomics, right? So what did we learn from the human genome? What did we learn? We learned that the Human Genome Project sequence is completed and it contains, of course, approximately 3.2 billion base pairs, right? So we have all of these things, right? So we know that we are very complex. And then once the Human Genome Project was completed, more and more and more genomes were sequenced. We have the mouse genome, or some of them actually were sequenced even before the human genome. We have mosquito genome, we have the rat genome, we have the chicken genome, we have the plants genome. We have lots of these microbial genomes, right? So once the human genome was solved, we still went ahead and solved lots and lots of genomes. And the reason to solve lots of other genomes is to do comparative genomics, right? How does human genome compare to a mouse? How does human genome compare to a chicken, right? Because even the vaccine, right? We have to test it in, a, in some other animal. We cannot put a test vaccine in a human, right? So we have to do testing whether something is working or not. And for that, we need to figure out what is a good model to use for testing, right? So the AstraZeneca vaccine was tested in a monkey, right? Because monkeys and chimp, right? They're closest to the human. So if it works in a chimp, it will work in a human. So we really need to understand just not human, we need to understand other organisms so that we can do comparative genomics, right? But we are, we are facing a lot of challenges because of the sequencing of all of these, right? So we have lots and lots of bases. We have lots of lots of sequences that are coming from environment. We have lots of sequences uh, in Uniprot. KB stands for knowledge base. These are sequences of proteins. And then we have Proteins are divided into domains, smaller fractions. That's what does the function. And we will learn a lot of these things over and over again through the course of this week. So you will understand all of this by end of this week, right? So 
We have lots of three-dimensional structures. We have lots of families of proteins and all of these things, right? So at the end of the day, to summarize, we are all going to deal with a huge amount of data explosion, right? So that's all we are. So once we have data, how do we use the data, right? So we have to create data bases that holds all of this data, right? Now, once we have the data, we have to put them in form of databases so you and me can use this databases, right? Amazon is a database, right? You go through different databases, right? So you go through the database behind it. And then once you have it in a database, then using tools, we can extract knowledge, right? So these databases are knowledge bases, right? These are the ones that are used in genome analysis and you are going to learn a lot of different databases and the tools to, in order to extract knowledge from all of these databases, right? So you have lots of molecular biology databases, right? DNA sequence databases and all of these things, right? So these are all the different databases. You have lots of data, but you also have increasing amount of databases as well. Now this, all of this data has given birth to the era of ohms and omic era in biology, right? So this is all of you probably know, this central dogma of molecular biology, and you can actually translate this into omics, right? At the end of the day, it all starts with the genome, right? DNA, then the DNA becomes RNA, and then the RNA becomes protein, and the protein has to fold into these structures, three-dimensional structures, in order to be able to do its function, right? So each one of this can be translated into an omic term, right? So now let's do that, right? So this is the core of bioinformatics, right? So DNA, right? So then you have the RNA, right? DNA gets trans to an RNA, mRNA, right? Messenger RNA and the COVID vaccine is an mRNA vaccine, right? It actually is against the mRNA that codes for a protein. Then this codes for a protein and then this folds into a structure. And then we understand the functions in the context of metabolism, Meta metabolites and metabolism and all of those things. Now, I want you to help me here. Can you translate DNA to an omic term? What is the what omic term describes a DNA? Can uh, can any of you put it in the chat? So if you translate this into an omic term, what would that be? Yes, absolutely, fantastic, um, Anushka. Right. So DNA is trans is genomics, right? The all the data from DNA is translated to genomics. What is all the omics for uh, for RNA, right? Vicky, that is correct. I'm going to wait for a second. We, we, we are going to do first RNA and then we'll get to the proteins, right? Proteins is proteomics, absolutely correct. Yes, RNA is transcriptomics, absolutely fantastic. And structure, that is not a, a formal term. I came up with the term and I call it, I call it structuromics, right? And now people are using it in the literature as well. So I just refer to structure as structuromics, right? And function is metabolomics. That's correct, Gerald. Metabolites is metabolomics, right? For function, absolutely correct. Now function is also functionomics, right? Determining from structure is functionomics, right? So it's also, again, this is a term that's being used. So now you can understand what is bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is combining all of this omics together, right? From DNA to understand. At the end of the day, all of us are interested in understanding functions, right? So we want to understand functions. If we don't understand functions, we cannot solve the problem of biology, right? We have to understand how, how everything is working. The spike protein in COVID. I'm, I keep repeating COVID because that is where we are living in right now, and all of you can relate to COVID. So that's why I keep bringing up COVID, right? So spike protein is the most important protein in in. That's why we have to understand the function of the spike protein, and that's when we can actually create vaccines. We can create therapeutics, right? So all of this is translating into omics, and this is where all the huge amount of data 
that defines bioinformatics. Of course, I've not put all the omic terms here, right? That there are a lot more omic terms within this that exist within this, right? I'm just giving you the big picture, right? We have genomics, proteomics, and all of those things, right? And anomics means unknown. If there, is, there are lots of things that we still don't know, and we club that all into unomics, it, anomics or whatever it is. So these are all the other omics, right? Interactomics, glycomics, and all of those lots and lots more omic terms, right? So, and structure omics, right? So now we went through a formal definition of bioinformatics, if you all remember, right? It's data processing, data collection, getting information from it, getting knowledge out of it, but now, now that I, I, I told you a different way of looking at bioinformatics, do you think we can come up with a different definition for bioinformatics that encompasses all of this omics terms, right? So I came up with something myself, right? Uh, there is a new definition of bioinformatics and my new, new definition of bioinformatics is all of this, right? So bioinformatics encompasses a lot of different aspects of omics, right? Functionomics, proteomics, metabolomics, in fact, even mathematics, we need math in order to be able to calculate different things, interactomics. So I keep changing this over and over. This also can be used for defining system biology as well, right? So to me, this is a simpler definition of bioinformatics. And this is my definition. Do you all think you can fill this up? For me, just guess what is the definition. This is just for fun. So what can in a definition of bioinformatics can actually be? What do you think? Do you think that um, you can fill this? Any guesses from what I just told you? Any guesses? Identification, good uh, identification. It's actually a good, um, good guess. I-D-E-N, -E that word identification doesn't fit here, but although you are correct, Sarita, identification can actually, next time I should think about that. So this is actually interaction, let's see, I-N-T-E-R-A-C-T-I-O-N. Oh my goodness, interaction interpretation, oh my God, you came up with something else, guys. Oh, integration, that's correct. So, so integration of omic terms. Honestly, I think Gerald and Ronald, I am going to write down your definition because you know what, that also fits here and you are correct, right? Interpretation probably doesn't. So I'm gonna write down for future, amazing, amazing. So you have given me a new definition. So it's either integration of omic terms or interaction between all different omic terms. I love that, fantastic. So my new definition is simpler. It's pretty much, you all agree with me? So it's just an integration of omic terms, right? So now sequence analysis is actually very, very important. So we have lots and lots of millions of sequences in public databases. We have more da data in, in other proprietary um, Thank you. So completion of more genomes. So what, right? So in all of these sequences, what you can find in all of these sequences, something that is hidden, right? You can just from the sequence, it has huge amounts of structural, functional, and evolutionary information. It's all hidden in the sequence. We just have to learn how to pull up that lecture, that information that is hidden in these sequences out and make use of that meaningful, right? So these are all these sequences and resources are very valuable to us, right? And there are lots of structures as well, right? So there's, there's all of these sequences are very, very important and that form the foundational principles for the bio, for bioinformatics, right? Just from the sequence we are going to, if we are, I'm going to show you how you can extract the function of the sequences how can you extract the structure of the sequences? How can you extract and put them together and go and understand how a single mutation is causing a disease, right? That's what it's going to be fascinating just because from the, see everything is in within the sequence. You just have to learn some tools and resources so that you understand how to manipulate that and understand. And it's like decoding, it's like a puzzle, right? It's literally like a puzzle. 
you just have to find and decode things. Now, we are still far away from actually solving a human puzzle of the human genome, right? We still are far away, but we're getting inching closer and closer to understanding at least that things are very complex, right? So, so now what's in a sequence, right? So you have huge amount of structural information. You have functional information, right? And what you immediately understand if sequences are very similar to each other, and you uh, this is called an alignment, you align sequences row by row, and if you find that they look alike, this look alike, and then there are regions that are highly conserved, right? This, if you look at this column, in every sequence, and all of these sequences may be from different organisms, right? So this sequence may be from human, this sequence may be from a mouse, this sequence may be from a plant, this sequence may be from a worm, this sequence may be from a bacteria, but yet, if you put them all together, there are things that are common between them, right? That's what we do. Well, we will start saying, oh my God, this sequence from a mouse and this sequence from a human are very close to each other. So they have to have a similar function. That's how we actually correlate and come up with things. So this is, so just this sequence contains everything. And if you're all able to, you're all very, very smart and you all can decode this very easily and you will win a Nobel Prize, right? To, find up simple methodologies of coming up with different things, right? So I'm sure that think, think and keep an open mind and a, anyone can win anything, right? Anyone can do all of this, right? So now perfect timing, right? So this is, uh, this is it's actually an hour. I'm a, it's amazing. So what I have done to just summarize, all I have done in the last one hour is data, right? There's so much of data. We defined what bioinformatics is. And we also understood that sequencing the human project was the first thing that gave rise to so many ohms and omics era in biology. And now we are looking at the central dogma of molecular biology from the eyes of data, right? So we converted the central dogma of biology to meaningful terms like genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and all of those things, right? So omic era. So this is the summary, right, for the first thing. Now I'm gonna pause for a second and see if any of you have any questions. Uh, and then we can move on to the next aspect of um, why we are drowning in. And just because the human project genome you know, was sol solved, we have come a long way, but we still have longer ways to go. And when the human genome project came, we all celebrated. Right? We all were, oh my God, oh my God, if we, now we know everything about the human genome. We can actually solve all the diseases. We can find cures for all the diseases, but after 17 years, we still don't, right? So I'm going to tell you from the human genome project, what else happened and where we are today for the next part of the lecture. Now I'm going to pause for a second and see if any of you have any questions. Do you all have any questions? If not, I can just, um, okay. So is interacting refers to branches relationship between nodes in, uh, so yes, actually just curious, absolutely. It's a fantastic question, Gerald. And in fact, you know what, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about uh, interactomics in the context of three-dimensional structures tomorrow, if, if we all meet again tomorrow, I'm not sure. So, right, so it all depends on you guys, right? So how, uh, how interesting I've made this lecture for you today to, to make sure that you all come back tomorrow, I'm not sure. How many of you are going to come back tomorrow? But interactomics is interactions. You're absolutely correct. It is actually interrelationship between metabolites, not only necessarily metabolites, but between proteins that actually produce these metabolites, right? So if you get if in a given pathway, right? So you have many different steps, right? So step one, protein in step one or an enzyme interacts with one thing in step two. So the interaction between those two protein has led to the whole world of interactomics. What, which protein interacts with what and, and upstream and downstream. Yes, you are correct. Long story short, you are absolutely correct. That's what interact, interactomics actually is a summary of interactions in a given pathway, right? So any other questions? Oh yes, Mohammed has a question. I, I see a, a hand, um, Mohammed is uh, raising his hand. So um, 
Is he able to unmute? I'm not sure, Mohit or uh, Uh, yes, I'll just unmute him. Yes, Mohammed, you can unmute yourself now, I think. I think he's not here, maybe. Yeah, Mohammed, are you... Am I audible? Um, or you can actually maybe put your question in the chat. Um, Okay, so I'm going to continue and uh, Mohammed can um, ask his question in a chat or I can, you know, we can talk later. So if there are no other questions, I'm just going to move to the next part where we're going to talk about that we are all in an era of big data, right? So, so diseases, that's what we're all interested in, right? So diseases are manifestations of something that's gone wrong in a gene, right? So if something gets mutated, right? So here you see that everything, all the sequences uh, share with us the lecture. So we will be sharing the recorded video with you. We will not be sharing the slides. We will be sharing the recorded video that actually shows you all the slides. Okay, so here you have all this, if you look at this, um, this column, right? You see all of them are glycines here. And suppose I mutate one amino acid here, since this is highly conserved, this is going to, depending on what this G is mutated to, it could lead to a change in its structure and change in function, right? So, um, so diseases are a manifestation of something that's gone wrong with one amino acid in a protein, right? So the pieces inside of you that make you who you are all is you have a, this is the whole genome and then you are, we all have chromosomes, right? Then within which we have the genes and then there are lots of genes and between two genes, of course, you have the intronic region or intergenic, right? So, uh, and, and during the process of the um, central dogma, right? So all of these intergenic regions are removed and the genes are connected to each other, right? So you have the genome, then you have the DNA that codes for your genes, right? So it has genes within them and these genes code for proteins, <clears throat> right? And these are the ones that actually have biological functions in the cell. And all of the proteins have to fold into three dimensions, right? So if you look at the whole genome, the fascinating point of the genome is that the genome is organized in a very disciplined manner and every single protein has a specific function that it has to do. Not only it has a specific function, but it also has to do its function at a specific time during the process, right? So if it's doing things out of its turn, that's when something goes wrong, right? Because the cell is not used to this particular protein showing up when it's not supposed to show up. And proteins, when they work outside of their turn, the cell doesn't know. So that's when, you know, and some proteins get, ex the proteins get expressed in different cells, right? You don't have a heart cell in your kidneys or you don't have a kidney cell in a lungs. But when you do find those in different organs, then there is a problem, right? If there is a protein that has to be, each organ has its own function, right? So your heart muscle, right? It has some proteins that uh, makes your heart pump and all of those things. Specific things have specific functions in your body and in the cell. Each and every cell has the same number of proteins and the same genome, but some proteins are expressed only in certain organs, right? The kidneys, there are specific proteins that work to make the kidneys. There are specific proteins that then genes get expressed in the heart and heart muscles, right? But sometimes when these wrongly get turned on in other organs, when they're not supposed to get turned on, that's when you start getting diseases because they are suppo they're not supposed to be there. They're in the wrong, wrong place at the wrong time. And so it, it creates problems for the cell, right? So so everything. So the human genome project, right? So it has transformed that the way we think about diseases, right? We have learned a lot of different things, right? So what we have learned is from a DNA, right? Replication, DNA, 
and then you have transcription. Again, I'm repeating the central dogma and then RNA produces proteins, right? Translation at the end of the day, amino acids and then proteins. Then the uh, amino acids are produced into a stretch, a stretch of amino acids. They have to fold in a specific manner in order to produce proteins. And then the proteins have a specific structure in three dimensions. And then these proteins fall within given pathways, right? So this is the genome and this is the genotype. And then this is, uh, I have not blurred the slides. I didn't change anything at all. Um, yeah, I've, I've not changed anything at all actually. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, oh, yes, everything is fine on our side. Maybe uh, the one who's asking uh, might have some poor net connectivity. That yeah, could be a reason on your end, yes. Yeah, it may be, um, yeah. It's fine, okay. So uh, hopefully, yeah, I think maybe the internet connection and once it saw it probably will resolve itself, okay? So from a genotype, and this is what is the phenome or the phenotype, right? So phenotype is what we actually see, right? You have a cold, you have a headache, you have pain, um, and that is the phenotype. That's what you're actually feeling, right? But you don't know what has gone wrong inside. There's something that's gone wrong inside in the genome that is actually making you cause having a headache, you have a migraine, that is a phenotype. All the effect is all phenotype, right? Genotype is the one that actually causes, has the changes, but the one, what manifests itself is the phenotype, right? So, um, and so now diseases, there are lots and lots of diseases, right? So they're classified into monogenic diseases like sickle cell anemia. I'm sure all of you have heard of sickle cell anemia, right? So we're gonna be talking a lot about sickle cell anemia, and sickle cell anemia is and is a very simple, in a sense, it's a monogenic disease. It's not a simple disease, but it's a monogenic disease, which means there is a mutation in one, just one single gene and one amino acid has changed in that gene. Mono means one, right? Genic is gene, right? So there is one single mutation in a gene, in one gene, and that causes a disease, right? and the disease is sickle cell anemia. Now there are lots of complex diseases, which are polygenic diseases, which means there are changes in lots and, yeah, that's correct, Vicky. Valine to a glutamic acid, right? Or a glutamic acid to a valine. I always forget the combination, but we're gonna, we're gonna study that in depth. Um, so polygenic disease means there are lots of genes that are affected, giving rise to the disease. So it makes the disease very complex, right? Very difficult, right, to understand. So we have single monogenic diseases and then we have polygenic diseases and then we also have chromosomal disorders, right? So a child is having a problem at birth. The child is born already with a syndrome called the Down syndrome. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. Um, and so genomic disorders, right? So chromosomal disorders, right? So there is a problem with the gene. There is an extra chromosome. And, and the baby is born with a disease already. So these are all chromosomal disorders where you know it's, it, there is nothing we can do about them, right? Because it's, it's already the baby's born with the chromosomal aberrations. But now with CRISPR-Cas9, with all the technological advancements, maybe we can find, uh, uh, we can fix all of that in, in the near future, in the next decade or so, right? And then we also have lots of environmental diseases, infectious diseases, right? Like Ebola and COVID, all of them are infectious diseases, right? So, and now the old genetics, right? The monogenetics. It's so what we thought before the, the era, before the whole genome sequencing, right? About conditions that are wholly caused by an extra or missing chromosome are a part of the chromosome, say Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, and all of these syndromes or a mutations in every in a specific gene like cystic fibrosis or Marfan syndrome. You're all going to, if you actually continue with the, with the course and you are going to do a project, you will be picking one of these diseases to be able to go and look and, and understand, right? Is it possible to correct Down syndrome's post-birth? So um, 
at this point, Pia, I would say no. Um, it is it you can only man manage the symptoms and make uh, life a little better, but cure not yet, not yet, not yet. But I am hopeful that I'm not sure with all of the technologies as I just said, right? So now the conditions are of great importance to individuals and families with them, but even when added together are relatively rare, right? So Down syndromes are very rare. And 20 to 30 years ago, you know, we won't even hear about it. We won't even know about this. In the hospitals, you won't even have a genetic counselor who's going to counsel you um, and all of them, right? But now genetics plays a very big role. It used to play a small role because not many people were affected. We didn't know about it. But now because of the Human Genome Project, we know a lot about it, right? So these are all some of the examples of monogenic diseases. Now, do you all understand what monogenic diseases mean? Monogenic diseases mean that there is only one gene that is affected with one single mutation in that particular gene is called monogenic diseases. Majority of the diseases, unfortunately, are complex diseases, right? So a very few are monogenic diseases, right? So we still have a lot of monogenic diseases that we're able to understand much better and a cure as possible for those monogenic diseases, right? So the new genetics and genomics that came from the Human Genome Project, right? And the genetics is the future is now, right? Now, what we have learned from the Human Genome Project is that we have a 3.2 basis that's packaged into a chromosome, 3.2 billion base pairs. And then the mitochondria itself can exist alone. It has 16,600. And the Human Genome Project, of course, it was initiated in the 90s, and then it took a long time before we got the sequence, and it took a long time is because we didn't have technological advancements with sequencing. And that's why it took a long time for it to be sequenced, right? So, and of course, the sequence are finished ahead of time because they ran out of money is the story I'm hearing, right? Now, how does the human genome stack up, right? So a mouse, has 20,000 to 22,000. So you have a roundworm, you have fruit flies, you have bees, all of this have so many genes, right? So now, how many genes do you think that humans actually have? What is your guess? Pick one option. Let's see whether you're able to get this right. So how many genes do we actually have? Any guesses? You can just guess B, okay, C, Okay, C, okay, C, that's what a lot of you are saying, 35,000, a B, okay, some Bs, a lot of Cs actually, right? A lot of Cs and some Bs, let's find out. So, oops, sorry, it's not C again, it does not C, but let's see if it is B. A, okay, A, let's see A, oops, no. Let's try B and it is B. So what we have is we have, we still don't know the exact number, but we have anywhere between 20,000, uh, 500 to 21,000 or 22,000. We still don't know exactly. We are still continuing to sequence, believe me or not. After 17 years, we are still sequencing because we are, there are some chromosomes that are very complex. So we are still sequencing. We don't have an accurate number, but we kind of know that we are not as complex as we thought we were. And who, those of you who picked option C, you, are, you that was the guess that we would have made when early days of the sequencing. We thought that we are going to come up with 50,000 genes or 35,000 genes, because how can a small animal like a rat have 20,000 and we also, how can we have not have more than the rat, right? So we thought that we are gonna have 50,000. And then that estimate dropped down to 35,000 in the middle of sequencing. And then finally we were shocked to understand, yes, as per they have, they assumed it was 30,000, uh, but then, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, yes, there are some graph regions as well and complex complexity, but we don't, we are not as complex in terms of the number of genes, but we are still complex, right? So, um, so here we have, that's why we use, and we are actually, uh, we are very, very close to a mouse genome. So we are almost like 99% similar with a mouse genome. That's why mouse and rats are being used as model. Uh, sorry. Uh, so phenotypes, phenomes means phenotype, which is like headache, whatever. 
the effects of a gene mutation is called the phenotype, right? So geno, genotype is a gene, phenotype is the effect of the gene on you, right? So if you have a mutation in, uh, you know, uh, you, you in, in uh, type two diabetes, people with type two diabetes, right? They have fatigue and they have, uh, you know, th those are the phenotypes, right? The effect of the mutation is the phen of any disease is a phenotype, right? So now these are also a round worm has 19,000. So you know what? So although we are very close in the number of genes with a mouse, right? So, but we still are not a mouse, right? We still are very, very complex. And I'll tell you why we are complex, right? So the new dis genetics is virtually all diseases has a genetic component, right? This is how it happened, right? In 2000, we just understood a gene in, that was implicated in type 2 diabetes and keep looking at this, right? So because of the Human Genome Project, we started understanding more and more and more genes got sequenced. And this, I should change this to 2021. And finally, we understand that today, we understand a lot about what genes are involved in different diseases. And we thought that we are at a stage that we can just say, right, a real disease, a real gene, please stand up, right? We thought we'll be able to solve all the problems of all diseases, but we actually don't, unfortunately we don't, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you mm -hmm. think that we are still complex, mm -hmm. although we have only, um, uh, you know, 20,000 genes, right? But we are still complex. And we have identified more than a lot of genes involved in a disease, right? So Curated means experimentally validated. People have done experiments to show that, yes, this gene is implicated in sickle cell anemia. Yes, this gene is implicated in Alzheimer's. Yes, this gene is implicated in Crohn's disease. So curation means that there is an experimental determination that that particular gene is implicated in that particular disease, right? So what do you think? How many genes do we have that we know for sure or involved in a disease. We are going to do this when we do the hands-on part using Uniprod database. I'll show you how to pull up this number. So just take a wild guess. Even, you know, this is just more for fun, right? So B, oh, because I kept keeping my cursor on B. Ahmed says D. So let's see. No, Ahmed, no, C. Okay, so that's not C. So it's actually B. We have, so, we are going to actually um, do this in uh, by hands on, right? So we have about, actually this number may be a little bit uh, more because I have not updated the slide in some time. So maybe it is a little bit more. We'll find out using Uniprod, we'll find out, right? So from genes to proteins, right? So we are going from genes to proteins. Mm -hmm. And so how many protein mm -hmm. products do you think we have? So we have established, mm -hmm. yeah, precision medicine. That's absolutely correct, Gerald. That's what I do for a living, Gerald. I do precision medicine. So now I told you that we have 20, close to 20 to 21,000 genes, right? Each gene produces proteins, right? Proteins are coming from genes, correct? So how many proteins do we have in our cells? How many proteins do you have? B, uh, okay, so uh, Divya, that uh, that is what I would have guessed as well, right? That is what I, because you know what? I was taught when I went to school, right? That one gene produces one protein, right? So one gene produces one protein, right? But that was what I learned. But now, you know what has happened? We have changed the definition of a gene. One gene produces more than one protein, right? That's why we are black, back on the square board and that we are very, very complex. So although we have the same number of genes, all of you say D, yes, actually D is the correct answer. Although, you know, we have only 21,000 genes, we are very complex. Although we have the same number of genes as a mouse, we are not a mouse, but if we're very, very complex, right? We don't want to be like a mouse, correct? So, so what has happened is we have changed the definition of a gene in the last 10 years or so that a gene codes for a polypeptide, right? So there are so many things. It's not a necessarily operant general. So it is actually alternatively, and uh, quite honestly, this 100,000 may actually be an underestimate. I have to go double check. Maybe we have a million protein products. Some people believe that we probably have a million protein products, right? 
but this may be an underestimate of that. The reason is because we have lots of alternatively spliced forms. The gene can be alternative. Yes, Kriti, that's correct, alternately splicing. Because of alternate splicing, a gene produces more than one product, right? So we are going to, we are going to look into all of this uh, when we're doing the hands-on, right? So um, that's correct. So, um, so what we have learned, although, you know, we have learned a lot right now, right? Polygenes, well, you know, I'm not sure whether it is called polygenes, but I think we are learning more about pseudogenes. We don't know if something is a gene or it's not a gene. So we have lots of pseudogene. And we have lots of isoforms, right? All of these gene products that are coming from an alternatively splice, alternative splicing are actually called isoforms, right? We will actually go through that, right? So to, just to summarize, I'm repeating myself over and over again because some of you are very new so that, you know, repeating actually, you know, just you feel like it is thinking in what I'm trying to tell you, right? Humans have fewer protein coding genes than expected. And then only 1.5% of this human genome is involved in coding for proteins. Did you know that? We have, we have spent the last 20, 30 years or more or 50 years studying only 1.5% of our genome, right? So we have a whole six feet genome and we are only looking at the genes that codes for protein. And the genes that code for protein is only 1.5% of your genome, right? So we have spent the last 50 years looking at that, but I wouldn't say, of course, in the last 10, 15 years, we have learned that, right? So what have we learned about ourselves that humans are not, and mice have about the same number, but we are not, we are different, right? So we have, that's what I just covered, right? So who's our closest relative? Our closest relative is a chimpanzee. We, how close are we among ourselves? We are actually 99.9% .9 very close to each other, yet we are different, right? So two, two, there are so many differences between two patients who have the same disease, right? Now we are still different, although we have our human genome, but we're still different from each other. We are very close. We are 99.9% .9 similar, but we're still different, right? Some, we, some of us like sweet, some of us like salty food, some of us, you know, I'm just making it very simple, right? And two people having the same disease, if you give one, this, you give the same drug, it works in one, it does not work in the other, right? Why? So we were all puzzled, right? So we thought after the human genome was solved, we thought problem solved, we can cure every single disease. Come on, let's make the therapeutics. Like, let's come up with drugs for the type two diabetes. Let's come up with the drugs for everything. Let's cure diseases. That's it, no more diseases. But that's not what happened, right? We learned a lot from the Human Genome Project, but that did not solve our mystery of any of the diseases, right? So then it came with a lot of promises, right? So it said, okay, you're gonna become, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be young forever. I like that, right? I don't wanna get old, right? So. And then, but what happened was in reality, what we found, sorry, what we found was two patients with the same symptoms, same findings, same disease, and you give the same drug and they have different side effects, right? Lack of efficacy. At a recommended prescribed dose, they have some, some of it is harmful, some of it is like, even when you look at the COVID, right? Some people have mild, mild COVID disease, some people have very severe COVID disease, and even with the vaccine, I did, I had lots of side effects from the vaccine. My husband had no effects at all. It was almost like he didn't even take the vaccine, right? So why two people, we are reacting differently, even though our genomes are 99.9% .9 similar, right? So orthologs, um, <clears throat> general, I'm going to come with uh, come orthologs. So orthologs are um, not because of orthologs. I would say more, I, if at all you want to go that route, I would more say more paralogs because orthologs are the same protein in different organisms, right? Paralogs are the ones within the same organisms, right? So, but what it is, I'm going to give you the answer to that question in a second. Hold on to that, right? So, so people react differently to drugs, right? So 
what happens is people, some people have toxicity, some people and all of those things. And we did not understand why, what is going on with all of these things, right? So what it is, is there is difference in ethnicity, difference in age, difference in genetic factors, different in drug, drug interactions. So all of it is, we are all similar, 99.59%. But you know what? We are still 0.21% different between each other, correct? So we said, you know what? We have to look at that point one. Yes, lifestyle actually is very, very important too. All of that. And now something is like microbiome, right? Even the bugs that is within you, that's beyond the scope for this course. But there are lots of other things as well, right? So what is next, right? So we solved the human genome project, but then you know we said, you know what, in order to understand and solve this problem, we have to understand the, the 0.1% or 0.5% that is different between all of us, right? So that was what was the HapMap project. Then they, we, we said, okay, we are going to look at all the polymorphisms that exist between the human population. And then after the polymorphism, it still did not solve the problem, right? So I'll tell you that right now today, we have to understand the entire human genome to be able to solve the puzzle. That's, what, that's where we are today, right? We have to solve the entire human genome, understand the coding regions, understand the non-coding regions, and it's ongoing, ongoing. You know what, it's going to be beyond my, my life, beyond your lives as well in the next 20, 30, 50 years. But one thing assured that informatics is a field that's going to stay. And that is what is going to become like a field that all of us need to know. And we all need to know this language, right? You will have to know this because the next 20, 30 years, we have enough data to be able to figure out how to solve all of these problems, right? That's why we have all of them. So HapMap, yes. Um, as I'm going to repeat HapMap in a second, Sasa. I'm going to go into details, right? I'm just going to go into details in the next few slides. I'm going to explain what that is. So what is HapMap project, right? So HapMap project is, of course, there are lots of other, um, yeah, I'm going to come back to HapMap project, but there are lots, if the slide doesn't, I'm going to explain it again to you, right? So these are all the other, um, um, you know, genome projects because we are going to keep doing this until we solve the problem. Now, you know, what is the newest? We're going to we're looking at the bugs that is within us. We are sequencing the microbiome. So now, no matter one of you may actually put all of this together and solve the problem for us, right? So we never know. So keep an open mind, keep doing your things and ask questions and learn a lot because you may come up with a solution, right? You may come up with a complete solution, right? So um, sequencing project. So now I'm going to come up with what is HapMap project, right? What is HapMap is. So you all know mutations, right? There is an amino acid change, but then there is another term called variation, right? These variations means there's one nucleotide that is changing, right? One nucleotide that is changing and at the DNA level, and this nucleotide change is actually a causing a change in the protein, right? So HapMap project is a project that helps us understand diseases and why some respond and others because we are identifying polymorphism. That is, it is actually a difference, nucleotide base pair difference between you and me and everyone else, right? So it is actually creates diversity in human population. Just imagine the whole world was with just one genetics that's it, right? It won't be interesting. Everybody is the same. Everybody reacts the same. And anyway, this is what is diversity because we are not the same, right? Even if you're coming from the same ethnic population, I am Indian, I'm from India, right? So even if I compare myself with some of you who are from India, we may be very different, right? Because of so many factors that we are learning now, environmental factors, nutritional factors, and genetic factors, polymorphisms, right? So that's what this HapMap project is about. How, how many of these variations are there in that 0.5% of the genome, right? So, so this is single nucleotide polymorphism. There is just single means one nucleotide, you know that, right? It's a base, right? So one nucleotide change, right? So it is a correlation that, so what are SNPs? SNPs are defined as one, this is your DNA, 
snip is something where there is just one base has changed and when this sometimes this base change may not lead to a change in your protein amino acid Sometimes this base may change the protein, like in sickle cell anemia, it has changed, right? The base change has changed the amino acid. When an amino acid change, then the, it changes, the protein changes, protein changes, the structure changes, right? Structure changes, function changes. Yes, change in a nucleotide, right? So SNPs are very common in the human population. Between any two people, there is an average of one SNP for every thousand base pairs. Most of these have no phenotypic effect, which means you and me, may have lots of changes, but we don't know that we have the change because it's not affecting us in any way, right? So less than 1% of the human SNPs affect the function, right? So, so alleles, they're very, very important to understand because they're alleles of health, they're genetic markers, they're easy to uh, and fast to understand, and they can give us genetic association in, and then it leads to a new omic term called pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics is all, all about how drugs, how you react to different medicines or drugs and all of those things, correct? Now, a map of human genome, it produced, believe me or not, we came up with 1.42 million polymorphisms. They sequenced and we found it, right? So now SNPs can be lead to altered protein sequence and protein sequence altering. And one base change changes the amino acid. When the amino acid changes, it changes the structure of the protein. If the structure changes, it changes the function of that protein, right? So mutations are deleterious SNPs, right? Inherited, you can inherit a mutation from your parents, right? Genetic disorders, right? And most of these deleted variations affect the functions of the protein, like sickle cell anemia, valine to a glutamic acid, right? And so, um, and so I think Vicky said that earlier, right? And so sickle cell anemia. So we are gonna be talking about sickle cell anemia, right? It's all about the three-dimensional structure of the protein. This, this is the structure of hemoglobin. This is just that sickle cell. This is the one single mutation that causes a disease. Can you believe that? My God, just one mutation, right? Majority of gluteal, well, yeah. So did I make a mistake on that slide? I'll go and check, right? Sequence, we are gonna look at the structure. We're gonna look, look at all of those things, right? So sequence genomes of large number of people, you compare the basis, like it's Facebook, right? So you can create profiles, you group people with the same mutation and maybe you have to give them a different drug and all of these things. It's like Facebook profile, right? You all have Facebooks and all that, right? So you create a SNP profile, right? You create a profile based on what SNPs you actually have. And the doctors, imagine the doctors can just use that for the treatment down the road, right? For some diseases, we are already doing that. But for most diseases, we, we can, down the road, we can actually do that, right? So correlations can emerge based on this, right? This is an example if, uh, of anticoagulated, right? So if anyone has a surgery in a hospital, right? What happens at the effect of a surgery is because you're not moving, you will end up getting blood clots, right? People who have surgeries in a hospital, they're given blood thinners so that they don't get clots, right? So you have to keep moving, right? If you're not moving and if you're in a, in a surgery, you're not moving. So they give what are called blood thinners. Now, I'm not sure about different countries, but there is a polymorphism that is there for dosing and there is a SNP that's been there for whether someone should get this or not, right? So these are all, some of it is made to the clinic and some of it will make it to the clinic. So for example, I'm Indian for Indians, we have to have a lower dose of this warfarin. We cannot take the same, same dosage as warfarin that is given to a Caucasian. So for me, the dosage has to be lower. So they will test whether I have a SNP in any of these two genes, yes, thinner. And if I have a SNP in any of these two genes, then what happens is I have to, they have to lower the dose for me because I'm Asian and Indian, right? So that's what it means, right? So all of these things. So more examples are there. You can look at SNPedia for all of these things, right? So there are lots of SNPs that we can look at, and this is going to come in handy for uh, practicing pharmacogenomics, right? Genetic profile to predict response to certain diseases, and the clinical goal is to do better 
treatment decisions, right? So, and there are lots and lots of genetic tests right now. And in fact, there are tests where they can test whether you have a, you have a high disposition to getting breast cancer. If you come from a family where people are already have, um, you know, a lot of members of the family of breast cancer, then you can already sequence a gene to figure out whether you have a SNP that they can predict that you may come down with breast cancer down the road in your life, right? So all of this, we have made a lot of strides. We have made a lot thanks to HapMap project where we are able to sequence and get all of these SNPs, right? So now the last projects is of course, the ENCODE project, which is the remaining part, 98.5% of the genome, right? They, when I was in school, they used to be called junk. They used to be called junk DNA, right? Now there is now no more junk in our genome. Every bit of your genome is important and every bit of your genome contributes to your well-being. contributes. We just have not figured it out. It is all there, but we're not figured. That's what we're gonna spend the next 30 years, 20, 30 years, right? And also genome-wide association, they, we have also found, yes, pseudogenes. It's, we are still learning about pseudogenes, Gerald. We still don't know a lot about them. So genome-wide association studies is about ethnic populations. So Indians react to drugs differently than Americans react to different than African-Americans. So it's all about ethnicity and populations, food and which part of the world you are. So we will be learning a little bit about all of these as well, right? So uh, all of this has expanded our understanding about understanding about diseases and uh, small variations happen discovered numerous diseases and will definitely all of this we have to collect it's all like a puzzle right we all have to put all of this together and we have to actually connect all of these dots together in order to solve the puzzle right we are getting there slowly steadily and more and more data is actually coming right now big data it has produced lots of genes and lots of SNPs and lots of diseases right so i have to and so big data has produced lots of different uh, biological data. And these are all the different databases that we can go to in order to put some pieces of the puzzle together and to understand some of the diseases, right? So as you go through the project phase of this, uh, you know, this course, then you will actually be looking at some of these databases in order to understand the disease, understand the gene, understand the structure, how to get functions and all of those things, right? Now, this is the future of genomics. It's already here, right? If you go to the doctor, they're gonna sequence your genome. They're gonna create all of these and they're gonna advise you on lifestyles and preventions and screening and all of those things, right? This is what we are doing right now in a lot of sense, right? This is the future of medicine, right? Sequencing, informatics, data mining, and all of you are going to become experts to helping. If you become bioinformaticians, you're all going to become experts, assistants to physicians in order to be able to help them decipher uh, a genome and all of those things, right? So this is what it is. Because we know more specific information, we can diagnose people better and all of those things, and we can eliminate diseases, and we can actually come up with prognosis early on, right? So now this is not the end, this is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. When I keep reading this, my head is re reeling over and over because I don't even know what Churchill is supposed is trying to tell. All I think he's trying to tell is it is just the beginning, right? Yes, there are lots of information in the intergenic regions and there are lots of SNPs in the intergenic regions here and we don't even know how to make sense of them yet, right? For some, we are able to make sense of it, but others, we are still not able to make sense of it, right? So, so let's, so there is something like, you know, if you're all interested, you can take a chromosome walk uh, in the interest of time. You can all do it at your own. I can, oops, I'm sorry, right? So uh, you can all, you know, take a walk of these chromosomes and it will tell you that which uh, chromosome, I think it probably opened up somewhere here, um, where is that? Okay, so you can you can you know take a walk, um, and you know so take and all of those things, right? So now I'm just going to show you that for a second, and I'm going to leave the last ten minutes. Oh, I'm going to stop share here, and I'm going to spend the next 
10, 15 minutes so that we can re revisit everything that we have talked about so that you can ask me questions so that it is all uh, clear to you. So this is the chromosome walk, right? So you can look at it at your favor, right? So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, right. So now if you click on chromosome one, Yeah, so it, it'll tell you this is chromosome one, right? You can learn about what are the diseases in chromosome one, right? So it's it's a 23 pairs. And if you click here, right? So this tells you each one is in oh, each one of this is a gene, right? This is tells you this is a gene that's called TARS1. That will tell you whether you can you can, you know, when you taste something and if it is sweet. Oh, Shen, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so now I hope you can all see, right? So I'm gonna go back. I'm sorry, thank you for letting me know, um, Shasta. So, so this is what you have. So if you click on chromosome one, right? So this is chromosome one. It tells you how many, grow, you know, and if you click here, right? So it tells you which gene is actually for, um, sweet. So this gene, for example, is stars one and a mutation in this, maybe you won't be able to say if something is sweet or not, right? This is this gene that is involved in the perception of sweet and other tastes. So if you have a problem and a, and a snip in your, this gene, maybe you won't be able to taste it. Maybe in COVID, right? Some people use their taste and smell Maybe this is a gene that's involved, right? Maybe they get uh, the polymorphism there or something happens, right? So, so here you can click on each one of these genes and see what each of this is, right? So you can all play around with uh, learning the different chromosomes and uh, uh, what diseases cause each of these chromosomes and all of this. This is just for fun. You can just take a walk. I call this, uh, this is the chromosome walk, right? So you can take a long walk on the chromosome and all of those things, right? So now I am going to just um, summarize for you. So maybe I can ask you, what are the, what did you learn today? So you can put it in the chat. What are the main take home messages from today, right? I don't want to overload you with any more stuff because I think I talked about a lot of different stuff, right? So um, what did you learn? What was, what are the different things that you learned? Each of you can just put some things on the chat of what you actually learned. What was your take home from today? Sasta has, uh, are you, do you have a question? Yeah, you learned about SNPs, that's correct. You got an idea about bioinformatics, that is fantastic. Yes, you got an idea. Uh, it was just like little bit of a flavor for what informatics is, right? So um, you wanna, yeah. So pseudogenes, uh, Gerald is a very little difficult topic. We won't be covering that, but then, you know what, if I find some good articles about it, I'll I'll send it your way. I will, I'll make sure that it reaches you. Yes, introduction to bioinformatics. You learned about HapMap project. Yes, Toby. Uh, and so what is bioinformatics now? After all this, we have learned for two hours, what is bioinformatics? How would you define bioinformatics now? Different omics, yes. And if I were to give you an exam, I want the specific term that we use that just a small person, yes. So signal, yes, absolutely. That is Saraswati, that was a very good point. Yes, monogenic, fantastic. Yes, intra, asogwa. Yes, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. I'm sorry if I'm not, but it's, it's an integration and I also learned a new term. Um, what was the other term I learned? It was um, inter interaction, right? Yeah, interpretation or interaction, uh, integration of omics, that's right. Um, a study about solution for human disease is absolutely correct, integration, correct. I'm gonna write it down. Um, integration is right, I think. I should go back in the chat and uh, come up with the other term that I, you guys came up with. That was amazing. Interpretation, okay. I will write it down, interpretation, Inter interpretation and interaction, I think it was interaction, I think that also filled in that spot, right? Yes, inter interaction, that's correct, a few more, good. Um, yes, it is bridging, Rashmi, beautiful, bridging genomics, all of this fantastic genotype to phenotype, oh my goodness, you guys got the whole gist of what I talked about today. 
Amazing. Yes. Central Dharma. Good, Sasta. Yes, Sasta Kumar. I'm sorry. I'm just cutting your name in short. I'm sorry about that. Um, Central Dogma. Yes, absolutely correct. Um, any other questions? Yeah, you all got the messages. You got about Human Genome Project. You got about how many genes do we have? Did you get about that? Uh, insight into binary genomics integration. Absolutely correct. 23 pairs. That's right. So, uh, yes, 21,000. Correct. Correct. Now, you all know that we have anywhere between 20,500 20, to 22,000 gene, genes, right? But how many protein products do we have? That's actually, you know what? I said 100,000, but maybe it's a lot more than 100,000, right? Some people think we have a million, right? I don't know the right number. You just keep adding zeros to the 100,000, right? Yes, you're all correct. So we learned about the Human Genome Project. We learned about the HapMap Project. We learned about the ENCODE Project, which is just, you know, the rest of the genome that contains the regulatory elements. So everything is important in a genome. That's another take home, right? And bioinformatics is an important field. I am just telling you one dot in the ocean, in the ocean right? So um, that is pretty much the summary of all of this. This is fantastic. Amazing. I think you guys have amazingly summarized everything I, I and you got it right. So, so now tell me any questions that you have in the last five minutes or so that we have. Um, um, but what is the importance of bio to, okay. So is it stored in one health concept? So that's actually a very good question, right? So informatics is for any organism, right? So when a dog gets sick, you can sequence a dog's genome to figure out what gene is there in the dog that is affecting it. For most part, it's a mammal too, right? So, so that is pretty much what it is, right? So bioinformatics, omics, don't get me wrong, omics is for any organism, right? Even microbial genomics we have, right? So pretty much anything you can compare it and uh, it, fantastic, right? So it is, you can use the data for any organism, understanding understanding a mouse, understanding a dog, understanding a cat, or understanding any of those things. So it is uh, pretty much the same concepts are being used for any organisms. And all of this data, either whether it's a rat or a mouse or a, a cat or a dog or anything, all of this data is actually at NCBI in all of these resources. So if you're all back, then we can actually pull up those things uh, when we are doing the hands-on section, right? Yes. So um, can we treat monogenic, uh, monogenic diseases? Yes, um, Anushka, that's actually a very, very good question. You know, that now there is what is called prenatal screening. So there are many genes that are screened as you are pregnant to figure out whether something is going to go, whether you're going to carry something that's good, that you're going to give birth to something with a disease. Yes, that is true, but can we correct them well, you know what the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is promising, but there are lots of ethical issues around it. So right now, I would say it is possible from a practical aspect, but in reality is we still have a long way to go because we have to, you know, we have to jump a lot of humps to get to all of those things, right? So uh, yes, plants, oh my God, there's so much of data on plants, right? So. Um, and yes, uh, did I add, can we learn machine deep learning to unlearn? Yes, of course. So you know what, um, I must add here that fine biotech and every single course that, uh, you know, you see on the platform that's been created in fine biotech, right? It's amazing. It's my favorite platform to use. You practically have all of this in bits and pieces put together in an amazing form to learn. And I think machine learning is actually one aspect of them. Yes, we are at an era because we need a lot of data right now before we can apply machine to learn from us so that a machine can be useful. Um, so machine learning is actually very, very important, right? That is a buzzword right now. And I think um, um, Ilya has an amazing uh, course on that, actually. In fact, I get my students to take uh, some of these courses as well myself, right? So, so how is programming knowledge important to bioinformatics? What level of proficiency? So, you know what, my advice is programming is if you're able to learn programming and the biology, no one can beat you. You will be, you know, you will be called and you will have so many options to go to. People will grab you if you know programming and biology together because it's an asset to have. So if you all are interested in programming, 
it's an asset to have because you can write, simply write scripts to mine this data very quickly. So I would urge all of you have that bent of mind to actually learn programming. Some level of programming is sufficient. You don't need to be a big, so you need a hardcore programming if you want to develop a tool or, you know, uh, you know, uh, all of that. But if you just want to get away with mining data, then, you know, um, you don't need to have an in-depth knowledge about complicated programming. And uh, yes, anything else? Any other, am I missing anything? I'm not, um, so let's see if I'm, uh, Uh, pass to pulse and this one R, yes. Uh, could you please give me a um, Okay, so um, okay, so some of you, I I will need a little bit more time to respond to you, uh, but I'm keeping a note of your question and I will uh, convey through Saralika. I will convey the answers to you because you know um, some some projects in R and some projects using FastQ files is amazing. There are lots of projects that you can practice with. And one project that comes to mind is you can go to a database called SRA. SRA is a database that has lots of sequencing data. So if you are, uh, if you're able to download um, if any disease that you're interested in, say like Crohn's disease or type two diabetes, you can download the FastQ files and then use that to go through the whole pipeline in R uh, for all of that. So you can actually pretty much go to SRA database and use all your skill sets um, if that has answered your question. So Harsh, I'm not sure. Um, yes, there are lots of databases where you can actually go and download. Okay, let's see. Um, so I know that Mohit um, uh, or Ilya, if he's on the call, can give you a little bit more, but I would say Python is an amazing language and R are the two that I feel that uh, is very crucial and important for bioinformatics because most of the packages are in Python. And R, now everything is transitioning to R. So R and Python are, are actually amazing courses to learn. And I think, I believe, in, um, Pine Bi Biotech already has courses on those, right? So. Um, so I think those two may be um, actually very, very important um, in my opinion, but of course, Ilya is, um, and Mohit can actually add to that. And I know that there are courses. In fact, my oh. students take courses. Yes, Ilya, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Zona. So just wanted to uh, clarify to those of you that are here on the call, we have um, a couple of things that um, if you are interested in uh, starting machine learning, Python coding, R coding, specifically for bioinformatics, for biomedical data. Uh, we have a number of these available right here. So if you go to the courses tab, uh, you can search here for R, for example, and you can have a getting started with bioinformatics, just loading DNA sequences, analyzing multiple sequence alignment, visualizing that kind of data, or going for more advanced introduction to data science where you get to learn how to manipulate different larger data sets, how to visualize them in various complex and statistical, statistically meaningful way, and then also to uh, train your model and kind of understand what that means. So the same thing for Python. Uh, you have getting started with bioinformatics in Python and introduction to data science in Python. And many of these scripts are going to be useful if you just uh, practice them, understand how they work and even save them. So later on, as you continue working on your project or doing some research, these are going to be very useful scripts. You might not necessarily become a programmer, but in any case, using these uh, regularly and having them stored and working on your computer is going to be very useful. So you can explore those. And then um, obviously you can search through some of the other coursework that is here. Some of this uh, includes applications of these methods to different types of project examples. Okay, so thanks, Ilya. Um, if um, I will, if I think we are um, out of time, so I'll, I'll get Sonalika to conclude, I guess, Sonalika. And um, thank you all for your attention. It was wonderful to interact with you. You were all amazing. Um, and you gave me a lot of energy to move forward. And uh, thank you all. I hope you learned something from today's lecture.
Um, hopefully you can develop, yes. Um, thank you all so much for your patience. I know two hours was a lot, but hopefully. Uh... Thank you so much, Dr. Sona. Thank you so much. Though I have done my bachelor's and master's in bioinformatics, but today in your class, even I was li like listening to each and everything you told. And it was so amazing to listen to your talk. Though I knew it all, but I was just uh, wondering that uh, this is actually such a great way to tell about all the concepts. And the way you told today, I think none of them uh, would ever forget like the basic definitions, the basic things the, st the st uh, students were asking. And uh, so you guys see, this is just a glimpse of what you saw. So sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry for this. So this is just a glimpse of what you will have in the whole program. This is just the beginning. It was a session one. And Dr. Sona, even I'm very much excited to hear to all your talks now. So, uh, okay. People are saying thank you so much. Thanks, Itan. And yes, uh, for, I would be remembering you for my life as one of the best teachers. Oh, Sing just wow. one session of yours. <laughs> Thank you. Sing just one That's session. That's a lot. Of Thank yours. you so much, everyone, for your kind comments, and uh, I love teaching. Um, and, and, and I, I, that's what I do for a living. I love teaching and I love students, especially you guys who are very amazingly interactive. So if you were not interactive, then I wouldn't have gotten the energy, you know? So I'm, th thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you all liked it. Thank you. Yes, exactly. So thanks to you all too, because you all were really interacting, asking questions and, uh, answering as well. So it was great instead of having a very uh, quiet class with you all, we had a really interactive session and we would be expecting the same in the other sessions as well. So now let me just quickly take you through the schedule. So I am first of all sharing the link with you so that you have it handy. Okay, here is the link. We have all the session details on this Genomics in the Virtual Lab blog here. We have uh, the details of what all would be covered in the program. So the program would be two weeks of the program. And unlike other programs of ours, the program would be continuous. It uh, won't be on all alternative dates. We would be updating you on the uh, dates as well. So we have all the schedule for the uh, program in the blog. You can go through it. And yes, by the end of the program, you would definitely get to do a project with Dr. Sona. And uh, yes, as Dr. Sona already told, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Arigi from... Uh, uh, we would be having a lecture on Friday. So it would be really great to have you all there as well. And uh, here are the session details with dates and what all would be covered in each of the session. And I am once again sharing the link of the registration page with you all so that you have no issue in registering yourself. Though I've explained to you all how you have to do so, but let me just share the link quickly. And if you have any doubts, you can mail me at marketing at the rate find.bio. We have Dr. Mohit with us. You can mail him also at mohit at the rate find.bio and we would be very happy to help you. Uh, Tanvi is asking any feedback form. Uh, I would definitely share a feedback form over a mail, but we don't have it right now. So thank you everyone for joining. Ilya, would you like to add something? No, thank you. I think this was a great session. Again, thank you, Dr. Sona, for joining us today and for everyone joining as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sona. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so, you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, good uh, good night, uh, good morning, and uh, good evening, and uh, from all time zones. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was fun as well. Thank you. See you all. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you so much, everyone. So let's meet tomorrow then. And we'll have a second session tomorrow. So those who are interested to register themselves, uh, you would have to proceed with it uh, now itself or like within uh, 10 to 15 hours so that I'm able to share with you all the details of the program. Uh, that's it. And if you have any, any doubts, please let me know. You, I've shared my mail IDs. You can mail me. Anytime.
Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Dr. Sona. Yeah, bye bye.